in this session, and I welcome you all to the public defense of Dr. Uh, Mr. Glenn Michael <laughs> Oman. No, was too early. Mr. Glenn Michael Oman has presented to the faculty his PhD thesis on the topic Evolutionary Properties of post hgb Biomes. Impartial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of PhD in science, astronomy, and astrophysics. First of all, let me introduce the members of the exam committee. We will start with the remote members. So first of all, we have Professor Rod Izzard from the University of Surrey. Hello. Good afternoon. The second member is Professor Jun Sundquist from the University of Leuven and the Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Institute of Astronomy. Right. Okay, then we have Professor Luc Sana, also from Leuven. Yeah. Also there. Then the other remote colleagues are two supervisors of Glenn, uh, Professor Gijs Nelemans from Radboud University. Good we afternoon. Have Dr. Honor Pols, also from Radboud University. Then we have Professor Luc Sana, Hello. also from Leuven. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Then uh, we have had all remote members, I think. Yeah, then we are live here. We have Professor Christopher Walkes from Perry Leuven, and to end, we have Professor Hans van Winkel, promoter of Glen. Me, myself, I'm Mickey de Kok. I act as chair of uh, this committee, and I'm also a member of Perry Leuven. So, Glen shall now publicly defend his PhD thesis. You are invited to give a presentation of about 45 minutes about your work. Afterwards, the exam committee will ask questions and discuss your work intensively with you. So I give you the floor. Yeah, thank you. All right. So First of all, thank you, Mika, for introducing everyone. And also, welcome to everyone that's joining this event, either uh, here in the auditorium or online, of course. Um, so in this pre thesis presentation, I will first start by introducing the main uh, objects that I've been studying these past years, which are the post hgb binaries. And then in the second part of this uh, presentation, I will focus more on the uh, science that I've been doing in the past four years as well. But first, in order to understand what these post hgb binaries are, we should uh, first have a look at how a star like our own sun evolves. And so first, uh, of course, uh, the evolution of a star like our own sun begins with a relatively small and yellow star that is burning hydrogen in its core. And it can also do that quite stably for a long time. And in fact, it turns out that the majority of all the stars in our, uh, in our own galaxy are also in this main sequence phase, as we call it. But inevitably, at some point, the hydrogen in the core of the star runs out. And what happens is that the star will uh, start burning hydrogen in a shell around the now formed helium core. And also, it will, uh, the structure of the star will react by expanding and becoming brighter. And also, the outer layers of the star will cool down. And the star then becomes, of course, a nice name, a red giant, because of the giant and the color. But also an important side effect of a star becoming a red giant is that the outer layers become less tightly bound. And um, well, what happens is that the star will begin to launch uh, significant stellar winds. So the outer layers of the star are slowly stripped away by its own uh, radiation and all the other things that are important for this that I won't explain right now. But slowly the envelope of the star will then uh, be expelled, which then leads to uh, uh, at some point, the star then becomes a white dwarf, which is just the bare core of the star that is left, which is pretty hot. And also, what happens at the very beginning of this hot stage of the white dwarf is that it begins to light up and ionize all the surrounding material that has been expelled recently, which then produces these nice planetary nebulae pictures, which has nothing to do with planets, uh, but still it's a nice thing. But so post hgb stars are then located here in this transition phase from the star become going from the uh, red giant to it becoming the bare core of the star and it does so very very fast so it's a transition phase 
only lasts for a couple of thousand years, which may seem long for a human person, for a human being, but in terms of the life of a star, this is very short, right? So if you would compare the total lifetime of a star to that of a human life, then this post hub phase would only last for about half an hour or so. And of course, this is also the reason why, the, why there are very few post hub stars that we observe in our galaxy, because you need to be in the right, well, you need to observe the star at the right time in its life. And so for now, there are about 300 of such post hub stars known uh, post HGB candidates known at the moment. So something that astronomers like to do is they like to classify the stars on a, on a diagram by plotting them on a diagram. And one of the main diagrams to do that is, of course, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And it shows the temperature of the star at, the, at its surface against the luminosity or power that it emits uh, outwards. And so these two things we can observe. And so, um, Initially, the evolution, so what I plot here is also an evolution track, so one of the simulations of a star, how a star like our own sun would evolve. So initially, it would start out here at the bottom, so it's not very bright. You see that uh, it has, at this point, about one solar luminosity, so the circle with the dot means solar. Of course, right now, our own sun has one solar luminosity. Um, it also has, uh, yeah, so and at this point, so in this little circle is where star will reside for almost its entire life. But then at some point when the hydrogen runs out, it begins to ascend this giant branch, as we call it, and becomes this red giant. And there's a lot of interesting stuff happening here, but uh, I won't go into detail into that either. But what happens, what is most important here is that um, eventually the envelope of the star gets stripped one way or another until a point that almost no mass is left in the envelope, and then it begins to contract. It begins to contract rapidly, and it increases in temperature until it becomes this hot, small, white dwarf. Um, and so this is also where we find then the post-asymptotic giant branch, which is what our post hub stars are. So this is quite a simple picture, of course, but still uh, Quite interesting objects are post HGB stars. They are in a quite specific phase in their evolution. But unfortunately, in reality, things are even more complicated because it turns out that about half of the stars, like our sun, reside in these binary systems, for which Tatooine is, of course, a very famous example. And so these stars are then rotating around their common center of mass. And what's very important here is that the fact that they are uh, that they are together. So the fact that the star has a stellar companion as well, this will modify the evolution of the star also very significantly. And so for this, I to illustrate that, I also show here the potential, so the gravitational and rotational potential of such a binary system. So what's most important here is that we have a one-dimensional uh, potential in which we see then the two stars that are bound by, by their own gravity. We have M1, we call M1 one of the stars and then M2 the other star. And there are three maxima that you see here in this local, in this potential, which are then called the first three Lagrangian points. Um, and mm, where L1 is the, also the lowest of the three local maxima. So what is the point here? Well, uh, you see that each of the stars is well bound by their own gravity. So right now you see that if you were at one of the at the surface of one of the stars, you would have to invest a lot of energy to escape the gravity of the star, similar kind of to a rocket on Earth that needs to escape Earth's gravity. You also need to invest a lot of energy to escape the star. And so an interesting representation that we can make here, and a very important one, is when we take a slice here along the L1 Lagrangian point. And so what we see here is then if you plot it on two dimensions, then we can define here the row slopes of the two stars. So in this case, the row slope is, and yeah, okay, so these two row slopes are also connected in this L1 point. And the significance of the row slope is that when one of the stars, when the volume of one of the stars would be bigger than its row slope, and it would start to lose mass along this L1 point. Um, so basically, some of the mass of the star will not remain bound and will, will be caught in the gravitational field of the other star 
can then be added or accreted onto the, on the secondary, on the companion star. And so, of course, this is very important if we consider our stellar evolution, in which once the hydrogen in the core runs out, then uh, the star begins to swell up, become this red shines. And of course, at some point, you can have a situation in which it starts to fill this Roche loaf. And similar to a bucket of water that's overflowing, what you expect then is that some of the material gets spilled over onto this companion star, which we then call Roche loaf overflow. It's a very important interaction mechanism. And so in the context of post hgb binaries, we can see here also that uh, the presence of this companion star can therefore lead to the stripping of the envelope of the, of the red giant, which then leads to, well, which then at some point, once the whole envelope has been stripped, the star will then enter the post hgb phase, and then it will start to become smaller again in its Roche flow because it's contracting. And at this point, we are left with a stable Post -H, well, relatively stable post HEB binary. And in fact, it turns out that this interaction is quite violent because um, we notice also that a lot of the material has spilled over the L2 and the L3 Lagrangian points, or these two maxima. And then they get the material gets lost from the system. Although some fraction stays bound and forms this ring of gas and dust that surrounds the whole binary system. Um, and so this is something that we observe in almost all the post hp binaries that we observe. So here you see an artistic impression of what we expect a post hp binary to look like. So of course, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but what you can now already see is that we have the two stars, so the binary system in the middle, and then we have this uh, large disk of gas and dust that surrounds the whole, the whole binary. Um, but so, in order to understand how we come to this picture, uh, we need to we need to introduce some of the observational observational techniques that we have used in this work. Um, and one of the most important ways in which we can probe the stars is by uh, taking a spectrum of, of such a star, because of course the stars are very uh, very far away. So all we can do is point our telescopes and look at them. But um, we can do this actually very well by taking a, a nice spectrum. So here I show a spectrum of the sun. And what that means is that we take the light that comes from the sun, we shine it through some sort of prism, which then separates the light into different colors or uh, equivalently in different wavelengths. And then you see here also a lot of these dark lines that we see in the spectrum of the sun. And these dark lines are caused, well, they are absorption lines, which are caused by atoms that are at the very uh, outer layers of the sun that are then blocking the light from deeper, uh, that is emitted from deeper layers. So okay, it's uh, this, it's not very important how how that all works, but what is what is important is that all these lines give us a lot of information about which atoms are there, how much so which elements are present in the in the star, uh, how much of that element is present, and it also gives us information on the surface temperature surface gravity and so on so it's uh, there's a lot of information that we can see here and also what's very important is that these lines are subject to the doppler effect so you may have already encountered the doppler effect when you have had an ambulance that's driving towards you where you get a higher uh, pitched sound and when it's driving away from you you get a lower pitched sound which means that just the wavelength of the of the sound you're hearing is changing and in similar ways, in similar <laughs> ways, uh, what you see is for a binary system. So when the stars are rotating around each other, around the center of mass, what you see is that the spectral line starts to sh starts to shift. So based on whether the star is moving towards us, we see that the lines are going to the blue. When the star is moving away from us, we see that they start to go to the red. And so by taking a spectrum, we can therefore um, derive the velocity with which the star is moving towards us or away from us. And so in that way, we can then reconstruct the motion that the star is doing in its own orbit. All right, so this is something that we've been doing extensively. And for that, we have used the Mercator telescope uh, on La Palma in the Canary Islands. And so this telescope has been observing these binaries for a long time, for over 10 years by now. 
And so it has been taking plenty of spectra. So right now, there's it's probably also a good thing to mention that we have about 80 or 90 post HGB binary candidates uh, that we know of in our own galaxy. And so this telescope has been observing a large fraction of those. And so um, by observing these targets uh, regularly, we can therefore reconstruct the orbital motion. So each of these green dots you see here is a spectrum that we've taken. And so we can translate each spectrum to a radial velocity, and then we can fit an orbit through those radial velocities. And we can then determine what the properties of the orbit is. And so, for example, for this particular post HP binary system, we see that uh, the orbital period is about 140 days. So every 140 days, this uh, binary will have performed one revolution uh, around the center of mass. So this is something that we've done for plenty of targets, 33 to be exact. And so for each of these 33, 33 orbits, we can then plot the stars. So each of these blue dots here is a binary system. And we can plot the period and eccentricity uh, of each of these targets in this diagram. And so the first thing you see here is that the period distribution goes from about 100 days to several thousand days, about two to 3,000 days. And also, the majority of these orbits is significantly eccentric. Eccentricity means uh, the ellipticity of the system. So if the eccentricity is zero, then the orbit will be perfect, perfectly circular. Then if you have an eccentricity, then it becomes more and more elliptic. So the reason why we plot this on this eccentricity period diagram is because our binary evolution models have a lot of predictive power on what, uh, what combination of period and eccentricity we expect. And so this will be quite useful later on. So another thing we can do with our spectra is to determine the abundances of stars. And so what I show here is for one of the post HB stars, the uh, abundance of the different elements in the atmosphere of the star. And this is a logarithmic unit, which means that uh, if all the elements here would be at zero, then it's also with respect to the sun. So if all the elements are at zero, then that means that the abundance would be exactly the same as in our own sun. But so what you see here is that most of the elements are below zero, which means that uh, our star is quite metal poor, so to say. And even this underabundance of these elements seems to even scale with this condensation temperature. And the condensation temperature is a tracer for how easily this particular element forms dust, which means that the more dusty elements, so as you can tell, as you can say, have lower abundances. So, yeah, so for example, for scandium, we find that this uh, abundance is minus four in log space, which means that it has 10 times, 10,000 times less scandium than in, the, than in our own sun. While for sulfur or zinc, you can see that it's only 10 times less approximately. And the main idea behind why, uh, yeah, so this phenomenon is called depletion. And the main idea about why uh, a star becomes depleted is because of the following reason. So we have this disk of gas and dust that, is, that surrounds the whole binary system. And uh, the temperature in that disk is quite low, low enough to form dust grains. So which means that our elements are condensing into these little solids, to these little, little solids, and then thereby decoupling from the gas. Um, but so also it turns out that there's a lot of accretion. So there's a lot of um, matter flowing into the binary cavity from the disk. And it turns out that also only the gas flows in, which is now poor in uh, metals, while the dust feels a much stronger radiation pressure and thereby uh, remains in the, disk, in the disk as well. And because only the metal poor gas flows in, what we see is that uh, at some point when the star creates a lot of this material, we see these uh, um, underabundances show up. And so accretion is something that we find in almost all hydrodynamical simulations, where you see that uh, if you simulate a circumbinary disk, then always you see these um, large accretion streams that enter the binary cavity and then get accreted by the two stars here in the center. And another observational evidence for accretion is the formation of jets. 
So this is a bit more complicated here, but what we see here is the um, time evolution of the H alpha line, which is one of the main spectral lines in the star. And what you get in normal situations, um, well, more normal, so to say, is that um, you see this double peaked emission line, which is possibly due to the presence of, a, of an accretion disk around the post HGB star. But then when the companion moves in front of the post HGB star, you get this strong blue shifted absorption profile. And the idea, idea behind this is that um, the jet, that the bipolar jet is launched by the companion with high velocity gas, and that the light that comes from the post HGB star goes travels through the jet, where it is scattered away by the fast moving hydrogen atoms, and then creates this absorption profile. All right, so with all this information now, we can uh, um, better understand this artistic impression of our post HGB binary system, because now we see here, okay, the big star here is a post HGB star. We have a small companion, companion star that we cannot observe directly because it's just too tiny. But what we can see is the accretion disk that surrounds the companion. And the companion also launches this big bipolar jet. Uh, and so these accretion disks around the two stars are then fed by the two accretion streams that enter the cavity. And you have this big circumbinary disk that is quite hot, so near sublimation temperature at the inner rim, but um, becomes cooler and the farther we go out of the, the system. All right, everything looks quite good. We have a pretty good understanding of what our post HGB binaries look like, but not everything is great, of course, because um, when we think about, for example, the formation of these post HGB binaries, then we still have a lot of questions surrounding those, especially because, yeah, okay, which I, sh I will just show in the next couple of slides. So what I show here is a histogram of a large set of models that have evolved through uh, an interaction with a red giant. So we see here a histogram of the periods, the orbital periods immediately after one of the two stars in the binary system has gone through a red giant. So these are all models, by the way. And then we look at the period distribution. So yeah, the interaction changes, of course, the periods of the, of the binary system. And then we expect this type of distribution to arise where we have a bunch of long period systems and also a bunch of short period systems. So the long period systems you can uh, explain because of the case in which the red giant actually never filled its Roche rope and so it stripped its own envelope due to stellar winds. And uh, when you do that, then the orbital period of the system tends to increase. So we get a shift of these smallest to longer periods to the right. Um, but then we also have these short period systems, which in which the red giants did fill its Roche rope, and the system then entered the common envelope evolution in which the drag forces uh, spiraled the system towards shorter periods. So, okay, basically we get these two populations and then some sort of period gap in the middle as well. Then when we plot our observed post HB binaries in this uh, diagram, and we see that Okay, they fall exactly where we don't expect them to be. So they fall right in the period gap where we expect just a few stars to, to be observed. And uh, we expect our post HGB binaries to follow these other distributions because these are also systems that have undergone this interaction with a red giant. But yeah, it turns out that our models are currently not up to date yet, up to speed. Although I have to say that the physics that I included in these models is quite simple, but then if you go to into literature and you see more detailed and more uh, complete models of, of these population synthesis, then you see that's still not really a good match to the observed period distribution that we get. And, the system, and the, uh, yeah, the problem is even worse because at least we would have expected these binary systems to have circularized due to the tidal effects because the tidal effect is quite strong in when the primary star is a red giant. But uh, it turns out that uh, the majority of our binaries are significantly eccentric and the tidal effect is supposed to circularize the system. So we see that from our models, all the uh, 
binaries are expected to be circular and only at long periods you expect some eccentric orbits but we see that uh, actually our observations tell otherwise and so this is quite a challenging problem as well to see uh, the, to explain these eccentricities and this is problem is not only limited to post hb binaries because uh, well, when we look at the distribution of binaries that have to all kinds of different binaries that have interacted with a red giant star well then we see that uh, so these are all different types of binaries which i won't explain either but, so these all have interacted when they were a red giant when the progenitor was a red giant and we see that these all follow a similar eccentricity period distribution as compared to the red dots which are post hp binaries so it's a quite widespread problem um, so it's still a lot of work to do there but then our post hp binaries are quite ideal objects to uh, to study these interactions because remember that the post hp stars well they must have very recently undergone this red giant phase so they're on their way to becoming this uh, white dwarf and so there are actually quite a lot of clues still left in the binary system that might help us to understand these interactions such as for example this presence of this circumbinary disk that we observe in almost all our binary systems and so this brings me to the motivation of this thesis, which is to use these post hb binaries as tracers for how these binary interactions actually work. And related to that, we also want to investigate what the role is of the circumbinary disk that we observe. Because we already saw that the circumbinary disk, we have a lot of inflow of gas from the circumbinary disk that changes the chemical abundances of the stars. Um, and we also suspect that the circumbinary disk can have, uh, that there are some dynamical interactions that increase, the, well, it can explain maybe some part of these orbits uh, that we see. But okay, so uh, this brings me to the second part of this uh, talk, which is more focused on the main results of this thesis. And I will cover the next three points, starting with the fact that we see that our post HB companion stars have a relatively high mass compared to the uh, post HP star itself. And this is not straightforward to investigate because the um, because we cannot detect the companion star directly because all of the light that is emitted by the binary system is, comes from the post HP star itself. But what we can do is we can see how the post HP star moves as a response to the presence of the companion. And in doing so, we have made use of the mass functions. So here is you see the mass function distribution for the 33 binaries that we have investigated uh, with our, uh, well, for which we have done the orbital modeling. And based on these orbits, we can then derive a mass function. Uh, and this mass function is related to the masses of the both of both components, as well as the inclination angle of the system. So this also depends on whether we observe the system like face uh, on or or edge on, for example. So there is also a role in that. Fortunately, we don't know the inclination angle for most of our systems. But so uh, what we can do is we can um, define a distribution of the post HP um, masses, which is M1, because for post HP stars, we have a re reasonably good idea of uh, what the masses of the stars, because these uh, envelopes have all been stripped. So what is left is the core of the star, and we have a pretty good idea of what this score, well, how massive this score is. We can also assume a distribution for the inclination angle if you just assume that all the orbits are randomly inclined in 3D space. And then we can derive the distributions for the companion masses or find or solve for a distribution for the companion masses such that the three distributions together will give you a mass function distribution that then best fits the observed cumulative mass function distribution. Okay, so that is the idea. <laughs> um, and so we see that, well, the distribution of companion masses, if we assume a Gaussian distribution that is centered around slightly over solar mass, then we find a reasonably good fit for uh, the uh, observed mass functions. And so this is what that distribution then looks like. So you see that it's centered around uh, some, something slightly over one solar mass. And it also has a, a pretty large spread in masses, which means that we have 
quite a diverse sample of post AGB binaries right now with a large range of companion masses that can go from 0.1 to up to 2.5 solar masses. But what's also very important is that in general, the companion has now become the more massive star in the system. Because uh, at this point, well, our post AGB masses are around 0.6, 0.5 solar masses. And so in general, so or on average, the companions will be about twice as massive right now. And this is quite important for binary evolution models because the mass ratio has quite a significant impact on the binary interactions themselves. For example, the stability of mass transfer, to just say one. Um, but so yeah, this is quite important and can perhaps be one part of the solution or a clue to why the orbital period distribution looks, uh, why we cannot explain the orbital period distribution. All right, the second, um, main result is that we successfully modeled the depletion patterns in many disk type post HGB stars. And the way we did that was um, by expanding first our data sets from the 33 binaries we had before to just 58 galactic disk type post HGB stars. So this is quite a large fraction because there are only about 80 or 90 known. But so for six, almost 60 of them, we actually have spectroscopic temperatures and chemical abundances available in literature. And this we needed because, of course, we want to model these uh, abundance patterns that we see here, such as the one on the right. And um, what we also used was the Gaia parallaxes and optical infrared photometry to then derive the luminosity for, the, for each of the stars as well. And so the way that we then try to solve for this uh, depletion pattern is by uh, using a stellar evolution code, MESA, called MESA, uh, which we then use to evolve single post HGB stars. So here we then assume that the companion by now does not have uh, any impact anymore on the evolution of the post HGB star itself, because at this point we assume that the binary has detached already. But of course, what we do include is the accretion of metal poor gas from the disk, because that's of course what we think is causing the the strange chemical abundances that we see. And for this, we have used uh, a simple disk model in which we then have, uh, which we then get this type of accretion rate evolution. So the idea behind this is basically that um, the accretion rate onto the two stars in the middle is caused, by, well, or scales with the local density in the disk. And so this density decreases over time because on the one hand, the disk is viscously expanding, so we have uh, the outer radius of the disk is increasing over time. And at the inner boundary, we also have then mass inflow, which means that the total disk mass is decreasing over time. But there are so two free parameters that we include in this model, which is the initial accretion rate and the initial disk mass. And then we have two more model parameters that are related to the evolution of the post HGB star itself, which is starting point of the evolution or starting temperature and also the post HP core mass itself. And so now I'll just go through the main uh, results of this work. Uh, so what I show here is then um, a diagram that shows the effective temperature of the star against the zinc over titanium ratio. And so this ratio is, uh, so the zinc tends to remain in the gas phase. So it's doesn't tends not to form dust, while titanium easily forms dust. And so as the star gets depleted, what we expect is the zinc abundance to remain more or less constant, while the titanium abundance will decrease over time. And so the higher this ratio then, the more depleted the post HGB star is. But so these are two observable quantities, so we can plot our observations on this diagram, which are the little blue stars. And then uh, we also show here the model, uh, some MESA models, which all have the same initial accretion rate of 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year, but uh, have three different disk masses, which are shown on the right. And so of course, the evolution of a star, of a post-HGB star goes to increasing temperatures because the star is contracting. And so that means that our, uh, our models go from left to right. And so the, uh, as it evolves towards hotter temperatures, also it's accreting more material and becoming more and more depleted. 
All right, so uh, what we see here, at least on the graph, is that our models are not capable of explaining this, this, um, these objects right here, around 6,000 Kelvin, simply because our model is not depleted enough by the time that it reaches a temperature of 6,000 Kelvin. So if we increase the accretion rate, then we find much better results, because at this point, we can see that our uh, models did, are actually capable of becoming depleted quickly enough to explain all the stars that we observe here around five and 6,000 Kelvin. And in particular, this model that has a higher initial disk mass also uh, can explain the highest or the strongest depleted stars at low temperature. So that's quite interesting already. Um, but now we can also ask ourselves, how does this impact the evolution of the star itself? And for that, I plot the models in terms of age against the effective temperature. So this is the evolution time of the model and starts at zero, of course. And we have, again, our three accretion models. And the blue one is one that has no accretion at all. And we see that especially this dotted line, which we needed to explain those strongly depleted stars, has a much longer evolution time than the other three. And so we see that, indeed, this combination of high disk mass and high accretion rate can significantly extend the evolution of uh, our post agb stars. OK, so then we come to the final main results of this thesis, in which we then study the interactions between the star and the, between the binary and the circumbinary disk. So now we don't only focus on the star itself, but we focus on how the whole binary evolves. And this we do to explain these eccentricities again, because we see that here the majority of the orbits is eccentric, which we didn't expect. And then the idea comes forward. So what about the presence of the circumbinary disk? Perhaps dynamical interactions between the circumbinary disk and the binary itself can increase the eccentricity of the orbit. And there are a couple of ways in which this can happen. First one being Lindlot resonances. So what does this mean? Well, we have um, resonant motions of particles at the inner edge of the disk, which are then uh, and this, well, okay, the most important resonances are called here the outer Lindblad resonance, in which we have, um, in which a particle would perform two epicyclic oscillations per oscillation of the perturbing potential. So in any case, what happens is that when the particles actually have this, uh, um, when they are uh, perturbed by the central binary, they will launch spiral density waves in the disk, which then get dissipated. But those density waves tend to carry angular momentum and energy away from the binary, thereby also increasing the eccentricity of the orbits. Then another way in which we can have uh, an interaction with the disk is because of the accretion itself. So we have a lot of inflow of material from the disk into, well, towards the two stars. And so we have two accretion streams which trail behind the binary and which uh, and then also pull on the binary, thereby also taking away angular momentum. But we also have two large circumstellar disks, in which it turns out that the mass in front of the in front of the star in the disk is larger, such that the net effect is that it pulls the it pulls on the two stars, thereby increasing the angular momentum, again, and also slightly changing the eccentricity. But so we model these two effects. Um, by also, so we model the effects of the circumbinary disk in its entirety by simultaneously solving for depletion in the orbit itself. And so why do we bother solving for depletion? Well, the MESA analysis that I showed before um, gives us a lot of nice information on the initial accretion rate and initial disk mass, which is quite important in, our, in these uh, models, as well as the evolution time scale. And this is also very important as well because that's determines how long we allow our binary to evolve and how long the disk, the disk can interact with the binary. And so, of course, we also have um, uh, written a simple binary evolution code that then integrates the different effects that we include, with, such as, for example, the tides, which are important because they tend to decrease the eccentricity. And we also include, of course, the two other disk binary effects here in the code. And so the code will then integrate from a circular orbit from, and uh, over the evolution time scale. And then we see what the 
final orbit will look like and what its final eccentricity is and whether this then agrees or disagrees with the, um, the observed orbits of our binaries. I'll just show one example here, the one from HD46703, where I show the eccentricity against the uh, semi-major axis of the binary, which is basically the distance between the two stars in the binary system. And what you see here are then the different models with all kinds of nice colors that relate to the different uh, model parameters. And we have our observed orbit all the way at the top. And of course, at first glance, you can see that our models are unable to explain the eccentric orbit of this particular binary. And to see why, we first take a look at the short, uh, well, the high temperature orbit, uh, sorry, high temperature models. And the reason why these models are not able to become eccentric enough, simply because that they don't have enough time to, uh, um, well, because these models simply evolve much faster. So they only have a couple thousand years before they reach their current point in evolution because they already start at an evolved point. And so at this point, yeah, the evolution is just too fast and there is not, uh, not much, well, they don't reach high eccentricity. So this is not a problem for the models that start at the low temperature because here the evolution still takes a very long time, several 10,000 years, even up to 100,000 years. And uh, but in this case, because they also start at low temperature, they also start at a high with a large radius. And so the tides are much stronger in this case and even lead to a decrease in the eccentricity for some of the models at later times. So we have then two problems, either the evolution goes too fast or the tides become too strong. And so what our models basically show is that these kind of directions may actually not be responsible for the eccentric orbits, which means that we need to look at another place for the eccentricity, perhaps even the previous interaction phase in which the companion star stripped the envelope of the, of the red giant. So this brings me to the just a summary of the main results. I hope everything was clear enough. And uh, so thank you very much. And having presented my thesis, I now return the floor to Julie. Uh, we now turn to the question round, and we start by the colleagues who are the farms away from the work. That is uh, Professor Robert Izard in uh, Surrey. So the floor is here. Thank you for a lovely talk. Can you hear me okay? Um, more or less. More or less. That'll have to do. It's a very old laptop. I'm sorry. Okay, so I had a very simple question to start with. Why is the specific angular momentum in the disks so high compared to the binary before there was mass transfer and compared to the binary after that you've got at the center of the disk? OK, thank you, Rob. So the question was why the specific the angular momentum, not total. Why is the yeah. specific angular momentum of the disk higher than the, uh, also high, so much higher than in the binary? Um, and so, well, the main idea, I think, is that um, the material that ended up in the disk is also the one that just, uh, yeah, okay. So as you probably already said, because of you mentioned the word specific, we expect actually a lot of lots more mass to have been lost, perhaps not uh, along the outer Lagrangian points, but because we expect a fraction of the mass to have been lost along the, uh, well, in this orbital plane, um, yeah, so this material probably also took away a lot of angular momentum that was initially in the binary. And this can also be a very efficient way in which you can decrease the total uh, angular momentum that you had before and uh, uh, produce the smaller orbits that we see now at this point. And so I think, the, so of course, I think your question is uh, currently something that we don't fully understand yet, how the uh, material in the disk gains this angular momentum. So how we even form a disk in the first place. But uh, I think the idea there is that, uh, uh, yeah, I expect that the material that ends up in the disk just leaves the binary with quite some angular momentum to begin with, just along the outer Lagrangian points. Yeah. 
Is this a bit, uh, is this a clear answer for you already, or? I don't know the answer. That's why I asked you. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, it must be something you've thought about when setting up the models, uh, because presumably when you start your disks, you have to give them some angular momentum. Um, and presumably that's a parameter in it. You mentioned a little bit about the mass that you put into the disk, but not much about the angular momentum. And I assume that's a free parameter. Then. Yeah, it is a free parameter that we actually change in the models, indeed. By, uh, uh, it's a bit tricky because we just change the outer disk radius and that actually determines the amount of angular momentum that we insert. Um, but yeah, the current angular momentum that we include is also partly observationally based. So what we see in the actual post-HGB disks is that there is a lot of angular momentum in there. And yeah, it's a big question to why that is. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay. Any more questions, Professor Lisa? Oh, I have zillions of questions. <laughs> um, okay. Second one. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, are you doing a round or you want all of mine now? I, I, I don't want to take the floor forever. I do have one that's kind of related to the end of your talk. Um, you talked about the eccentricity and how that comes about. But your disk models are all circular. So I was wondering, what assumptions do you have to make to assume that the disk surrounding the eccentric binary is still circular? I would expect the disk to also be eccentric in some way, perhaps. Uh, and I, I wonder whether your models, whether I should believe your models, given that you don't take this into account. Yeah, that's a very good question, at least. But um, so indeed, we don't really assume any kind of eccentricity for a disk. But uh, of course, I think this is something that we observe in disks, that they become eccentric as well, along with the binary. Or at least that's also what we see, what we expect from the uh, models as well, from the disk models. For example, in the original paper of uh, Lubov and Artimovic, or Artimovic and Lubov, we also see that the disk gains, the inner rim gains a certain eccentricity there as well. But what we include, which I'm not sure is completely satisfying as well for the eccentricity. But what we do include is that once the binary gets an eccentricity, we also change the inner rim uh, radius of the disk as well. Um, because there is also a relation for that, which they have from their models. But I'm not sure if that's really, uh, well, if that's really relevant for giving the inner edge a certain disk eccentricity. And I also don't even know what the effect would be on whatever we are measuring when the disk becomes more eccentric. So, yeah. That's, I, uh, my, I was really wondering whether you think your tide, uh, your tidal interactions in the disk, you know, the resonances you talked about, whether they would work in the same way in an eccentric disk as they do in a circular disk, because uh, the, the formula you use, which I know quite well, are for a circular disk. So yeah. that may change everything. and. Um, I wonder if that's a problem. Uh, I honestly, I don't know the answer. So, I, but uh, yeah. To be fair, I also don't know the answer to that. But I do know that they. I think in. Well, I'm pretty sure that in uh, Artimovic and Nubov's models, they also got this eccentric inner rim. And since we uh, take a relation for the uh, eccentricity pumping from from their papers as well, then I expect that maybe this is already somehow taken into account. Of. Four, maybe. Uh, maybe, but yeah, it's uh, there's not much information on that, unfortunately. Maybe that's something we need to redo to check. Well, that might be a good idea. I agree because these papers are really old as well, and it's very concerning to me that um, and the later, and there's so the recent papers that came out that investigates the interaction between the binary and the disk. They don't seem to have strong as a torque that we find from um, that we have from. The models of Lubov and Artimovic. So, yeah. what would be the effect on your disks if the torque were actually, say, ten times or a hundred times weaker? What would happen physically to your disks? To the disk itself? Yeah. Uh, well, right now, we don't have any torque to the. Well, okay. 
we have a torque that's acting on the disk itself, but it doesn't change disk evolution in our models, which is probably a limitation. Okay. Because we expect perhaps the accretion rate to change as well, and depending on whether there's a torque. But then again, what we see in, uh, so what I have found in literature is that the accretion does not seem to change much uh, when you include the binary in the center, at least. Um, but yeah, how the disk evolves, that's a different story. So I don't really know how to. So I changed the angular momentum of the disk, so it kind of changes the, uh, changes how the outer radius evolves, for example. But, uh, I think my worry would be the inner edge of the disk becomes so small that it coincides with the binary, outer part of the binary orbit with L2 and L3. And what happens then, I don't know. It could be a mess. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Could be. <laughs> but that's something to investigate in the future. I, I like the idea. Of that. Yeah. Super. Did you want me to ask more, or should we move on to someone else? Or? We have one more. OK. Um, what is the long-term impact of the jets on the inner binary? Okay, so what is the long-term impact of the jet on the inner binary? This is something I know very little about, which is why I'm asking. So. Um, I'm not but, sure. Because I don't think that's in your model either, is that right? No, but so I don't. Mean, is it something that we should put in our models, or is it something I can ignore happily? Or Yeah, I think that there's... Yeah, I think that there is not much effect from the jet on the binary itself. I mean, it does take away a lot of, well, it takes fraction, it takes away a fraction of the material that is created yeah. onto the cannon, which is supposed to be a small fraction. But then um, I don't think it takes away a lot of angular momentum either, because it's mainly focused in the both directions. That's good to know. And uh, I hope Noam Soker is not watching this on YouTube, because then you're in trouble. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right. Super. Thank you very much. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. And we turn for the next set of questions, Professor Jonsu, please. Are you still there? Yeah. I'm still here. Please. In, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, thanks a lot, Glenn. Uh, very nice presentation. And uh, congratulations uh, again to a very good. Uh, PhD thesis, in my personal opinion. Um, of course, we've interacted quite a lot over the, the, the course of your PhD and also now after the internal defense and before that. And, you know, you have uh, answered very well to, to uh, and discussed very well a lot of questions. Uh, I can, of course, always ask a few more. So uh, I'll take my chance now to do that. And one thing is, uh, sort of a general, you know, when you have your, your post stage B evolution phase, right? Basically, you have assumed that uh, your star is basically already stripped uh, from the binary interaction, and then you continue to evolve. But the star, as you have said, it continues to shrink and heat up, you know, toward the planet. Why does it do that? If it's already, you know, it has already been stripped from 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 the envelope, right? Why does it continue then to 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 move, so to say, to to shrink and heat up? Yeah, thank you, Jon, for your compliments. Firstly, okay, so um, why does a star shrink? Well, the reason lies with the fact that at the start of the post AGP phase, mm -hmm. the envelope mass is very low, so we have only. 0.01 solar masses or so left, approximately. And so what happens is that when you remove even more mass, <laughs> what happens is when you remove even more mass, the density in, in the envelope decreases further. And so, okay, the density in the envelope is by now extremely low already. Mm -hmm. and by decreasing the density further, what happens is that um, the um, star becomes more stable for okay, yeah, becomes more stable against convection, and uh, uh, yeah, actually, what happens is that the temperature gradient in the envelope begins to um, and now I need to think increase, which means that um, which means that the star becomes hotter at its edge, and so it means that it actually shrinks. So it's basically um, 
the efficiency of radiation transport increases. I think that's just the, the right. Right. main thing here. And that continues until the whole envelope is stripped? Or, I mean, what is the transition here? When, and what happens then to, to, to so to say, I saw this also actually posted in one of the questions uh, <laughs> from the audience. What happens then to the certain binary disk? You know, when, when do, do, do you know anything about this? I mean, or do we know anything about this? So, so what is your question exactly? What happens? Yeah. yeah. I mean, which what is the transition phase here? After the, you have your post ADB star, which is now a very complicated, has a certain binary disk, it has the jet, it has all these complicated, but then, of course, the star at some point evolves toward becoming a central star of a planetary nebula and later a white dwarf, right? According to your nice evolution diagram in the beginning, uh, what happens then to the certain binary disk? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So, as the star becomes hotter and hotter, it begins to send out more ionizing radiation. And what we expect to happen is that the disk quickly evaporates. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, how exactly this will happen and how fast, I'm not very sure. But uh, I think that there are some models on this, including from uh, uh, Rob Izard, for which we, <laughs> for which we show that, uh, which models show that uh, actually the disk the disk mass will decrease very rapidly uh, at some point when the central star becomes uh, very hot as well. So okay. just the ionizing radiation apparently is, is quite efficient. That's removing the disk. Yeah. I think OK. That's... And is this something that uh, can also then be observed in some way? You know? Well, we don't see any disks around hot central stars. Maybe that is. But we also don't have many, well, well binaries of central stars that are wide enough that we, ex that we expect them to have been maybe um, a giant before. So, because of course, what we see now is mainly the hot central stars that have spiraled in completely. Mm -hmm. But they're, yeah, okay. Those, we don't expect to have gone through the post-AGB phase because they, the orbits are too small. But there are also some wider systems for which we expect maybe the star to have been larger in the past and then have evolved towards this hot object right now, and there I don't think we see any disks either. Uh, but they, we do, they do see a planetary nebula at that stage, so yeah. OK, yeah, thanks uh, very much. And then just uh, I had another uh, question, actually. Part of the results here is that you, you can explain the, the, so to say, the peculiar chemical abundances uh, observed or empirically inferred for uh, these stars, right? Uh, but you, you, you have your not very nice cartoon in the beginning with the jet and the big equation. This Shouldn't that also affect then the derivation of these chemical abundances? Shouldn't there be a feedback effect there on this? And that yeah. you have such a complicated surroundings so that that affects the derivation of the chemical abundances themselves that you are now trying to explain by this? Well, I, I'm not sure how that would change the derivation there because what we just see is uh, all the light that we see from the system comes from this uh, post HGB star, right? Mm -hmm. So when we take a spectrum, just uh, what we see is a spectrum of the post HGB star. So I don't see how um, this would change the, uh, the depth of the lines, for example, that we see in these objects. But so, didn't you show a spectral line in your uh, slide that actually did vary? Uh, because yeah, yeah. of the reactions with the jet, I think it was the hydrogen Balmer alpha line. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So why would that be affected, but not the other then? The other line? Um, well, so yeah, for that, actually, not sure exactly how the uh, other lines react to uh, the presence of the jet, but I think that's for the jet. Um, yeah, there is simply too few lines with, uh, or simply too few atoms and there's no absorption there for the for the other spectral lines. Right. We do see the jets slightly in the other Balmer lines, for example, um, but the H alpha line is just the clearest. But I, if you go to different elements, I'm not sure whether whether you can actually see the same, um, same effect. I don't think so. so OK. I, without that, uh, that, yeah, that this will change the 
chemical abundance determinations in that way. Um, on the metallic lines, you mean? Yeah. yeah. OK, thanks, then. That's, uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, then we go to Rusana. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's great. Okay. Uh, well, I certainly want to uh, first congratulate you on the, your work in the presentation. I think it's an excellent thesis. I'm very happy to uh, read it and I'll learn so much about the work you've been doing the last uh, four years. I have uh, only two questions. Um, let me see my notes. Um, the first one is on the eccentricity of uh, the post DGB stars, right? And the potential explanation that they would come out of the interaction phase while preserving some kind of eccentricity. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Or do you have ideas of how this could be that you can preserve the eccentricity despite a, a strong binary interaction? Thank you Rick, for the compliments first. Um, so I only have ideas about what this could be. <laughs> but uh, for example, very recently, okay, so our post HP binary systems are likely possibly not actually the result of an, a full common envelope. But what we see now in, uh, in models, for example, so from common envelopes is that we see the, quite some eccentricity build up when the binary starts to spiral in. So already there is one source of eccentricity that's possible. But I think in general, what we should look at is we are looking at a phase in which a large fraction of the envelope of the star has been expelled or removed or accreted by the companion. And if the if large fraction of the material is expelled, then it can take away a certain amount of orbital angular momentum and energy. And so it's this combination of the two that can change the uh, eccentricity of the system, or that determines actually the eccentricity of the system. And if for some reason you can take away more uh, angular momentum than orbital energy, then you would uh, well, at least cause a larger eccentricity. But other than that, um, I don't know if that will, uh, well, I have no clue on how this would happen or why this would happen in this, uh, in this interaction. And there are also some other ideas that, that you can have, for example, a phase dependent muscles, um, although this probably also won't cut it far enough for uh, the high eccentricities that we see. There are also triples possible, but of course we have a large fraction of eccentric orbits, so triples would be, uh, you need a lot of triple systems for that. Um, and so yeah, I don't know, other than that. Good, I think it's already a few uh, good ideas there that uh, we deserve to be explored uh, further. Speaking of uh, further exploration, I mean, you have observed and analyzed a sample of about 30, 35 uh, stars observed in Mercator, which is a third, basically, of what we know. What's coming next in terms of observation? Mm. Um, so, first of all, some of the binaries are quite difficult to uh, derive the uh, orbit for because either they have small radial velocities or they have they are pulsating very large or they already have very large pulsations, which makes it very difficult to find the orbit itself. But what's coming next? That's a bit difficult. I think uh, maybe you could go to the Magellanic Clouds at least to because uh, there have been some surveys there already by Devika, who has been observing these systems quite. And so if you, but it's very observationally expensive to have a, such a radial velocity monitoring program for, for imaginary clouds, of course. So but there you could at least remove the uncertainty for the distance to these objects, which is currently plaguing us a bit. Um, and also we look forward to Gaia DR3 as well, but that's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, aside from the distance, is there any other advantage to go to the Magellanic Clouds? Because you're paying a high price in terms of either signal to north or to the time, so you want to learn something. Um, well, you're probing different metallicity, but I don't think that's very impactful for our post HGB models. Um, I think that uh, 
another thing is perhaps that you have just a larger sample in total, because when we look at our galaxy, we're also a bit, so I suppose AGP stars are very far away. Really. So a couple of kiloparsecs, so we cannot look, uh, I cannot observe that many of, the, of those. You can only look at those that are not obscured by the interstellar clouds in our galactic disk. So for that, we can just use the magic clouds to expand our sample in total. But other than that, I can't think of anything else that we can use. If, if you have a larger sample, I mean, you periodic centricity diagram is already very well populated. Yeah. And it could be degree with theory anyway. So do you really have another 100 stars in the diagram to make progress? No, I think you're right on that part. I think it's much more interesting to, to really observe the post HGP stars in our own galaxy in detail right now as a next step. Because now we can also use the um, uh, interferometric techniques that have been around for now, especially Jacques is working on that a lot. So, um, and we can use that to to learn more about perhaps even the inner rim disk structure, as uh, Rob was alluding to earlier, and things like that. Yeah. So maybe Magellanic clouds are not extremely mixed up, but can be in some ways, well, useful as well in terms of statistics. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and my congratulations again. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Sano. Then next in our row is Professor Walt is going to a live session now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me now? Uh, because I guess we are not able to... Uh, uh, we are not allowed to shout here because that increases the <laughs> we produce. Uh, I want to congratulate you first again, uh, and uh, I have read that it's much interest, and you know that the subject is a subject that interests me, and uh, it's a very nice thesis, as has already been said by others, and uh, I appreciate very much the combination of, on the one hand, a very accurate and careful uh, treatment of the observations, on the other hand, uh, the theoretical uh, interpretation, um, uh, which uh, is always very nice, and so you do not just observe in order to, uh, to observe. And you do not just theory in order to produce numbers from your computer, you try to think of it. I appreciate that very much. Um, I have two questions, uh, one on the, the orbital properties, and uh, well, what, well, you have you said you have three contributions in the last one was the eccentricities. I have no question on that, but on the two others, I have one. Mm -hmm. So first, on the companion mass. Uh, so you produce this uh, mass distribution figure 3.4. And your conclusion is, uh, rightly, that it cannot be explained by just uh, um, uh, not, uh, white dwarf masses, which would be like 0.64 masses, that's by no means true. But it's already obvious from the results you have, the mass function that you have. In fact, honey, High mass, mm -hmm. which have always uh, struck me because that means that well, you have uh, fairly massive stars, and, and so the more massive your stars are, and the, least, the less you should, should feel of them. And so forth. But then there must be main sequence stars. But your mass distribution does by no means reflect the typical mass distributions of randomly selected main sequence stars. Mm -hmm. Going down, and you yeah. have somewhere a maximum a computer mass between your peak at 1.1 and, and, and somewhere two solar masses. It follows more or less the self peter log, if you wish, <laughs> but you, you would have, in fact, an excess of low mass companions. They are not there, or you can say, well, observationally, they are not there. The velocity is hard to measure, but most of these objects were not selected in the first place because of velocity variations. So what does that tell us? Yeah. So, so how can we explain this mass distribution again? We know what it is not, mm -hmm. but it doesn't tell, but what does it tell us in terms of a set of processes which have to Yeah, thank you, Christoffel, for compliments and everything. Um, so, first of all, I'd also like to uh, mention that uh, we also corrected for the lack of companions in the mass distribution, which means that um, 
Yeah, which means that actually this shifted our mass distribution that included more lower mass stars than what you would typically get from observations. Or okay, maybe I explained this a bit poorly, but <laughs> so what, what we did was um, in our selection of, of, so in our uh, way of statistically producing the, uh, reproducing the cumulative mass function distribution, we removed all um, combinations of masses and periods that would result in a too low semi-amplitude velocity that we would simply not detect because of uh, strong pulsations that we see. Right, so we kind of correct in that way. Not, I think it's somewhere in the piece. <laughs> kind of correct in that way for uh, not finding some of the uh, lower mass stars. Um, but so the fact that we then don't observe them, well, this can be very, well, this can be quite well explained in the sense of uh, the evolutionary path in which we then would form a post AGB stars in the first place. Because if you would start off with uh, a companion star that is only about 0.1 solar mass, and you would uh, have the Roche slope filling star. Then, what would happen is that the orbit shrinks quite rapidly already because of the extreme mass ratio you have at the beginning. And in that way, what, what's more likely to happen is that the system spirals in much more. And what we see for the uh, spiraled in systems in the close binary central stars of the nebulae, there the companions are generally about 0.1. Well, so around this mass range, so specifically a lot lower than those of the post HGP binaries we find here. So then the lack of lower mass stars can be mainly due to the fact that we, the uh, fact that these simply evolve differently uh, with the uh, binary evolution of the red giant star. That's then at least what I The few ones that you really find with the low companion mass can be explained. Um, yeah, so. Right now we have, okay, so you see in the distribution that there are quite some low mass ones expected within our sample, but we don't have direct observations of a low mass uh, companion star in the sense that if we, for the systems where the mass function is low, we also see that the inclination angle is quite low as well. And so it turns out that for even for those systems, there are higher mass companions, but statistically, we still expect them to be there. But, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe there is also a different way in which you can get to those. If you really interact with the uh, red giant star very late, when the star is almost at its largest, which uh, which is at the point at which it ha at which it has only 0.1 or 0.2 solar masses left in its envelope, if you interact at that point, or if you fill your rush up at that point, then we don't expect the orbit to change that much either anyway even if the companion mass is relatively low. So maybe something like that as well, it's possible. And then the second question is, well, in fact, it, it is on the evolution, uh, evolutionary models. And well, I have your front page and your back page, in fact. And the front page is, is the general model, and it, it's a very nice picture, which is very complicated. And it seems, well, to be a little bit well, there is the mass transfer to the companion, and then the companion is hard to be able to swallow it all up and then you have the post trial, but also some mass is lost through the total Lagrangian work and then comes in back at the other side. So you have three sources of mass loss and one of mass gain. Well, it, it's required, but it gives a little bit of the impression, and I hope nobody um, objects uh, to, to this. Uh, wasn't done badly, but it, it is like a very old patient who, who is losing mass. You know, it's, it's our old stars, and they're losing mass of all stars. And then there is an infuse of cleaned food which comes in on the other side and keeps the patient alive. It's a good or, presentation. So I have a question <laughs> which you do not necessarily have to answer, and that would be uh, would you feel uh, studying all this and in the present of what you're living through? That the people studying this kind of object deserve a three to eight percent salary increase, but that is another. <laughs> uh, no, let me just ask. Well, uh, you, you have all this mass transfer, mass loss uh, aspects, but and yet all of them are a little bit treated separately. But in a sense, it's a wound the system, so there should be some, some kind of of uh, of uh, yeah. 
balance between all them, otherwise the system would not survive, and we see a lot of them, in fact. And, and then I take the, the back page, there you have the red rectangle, which is very depleted, so must accrete a lot, but you see it loses a tremendous amount of money. Yeah. So, I mean, I have objected quite the two times in the past, in the past against models who said, well, I mean, this, this kind of atmosphere which is depleted is very shallow, and uh, the mass transfer is small. Kind of happen. So I am very much appealed by uh, your result that indeed you need uh, mass accretion rates which are much higher than they're initially suggested. Huh? Yeah. If I understand that. But uh, is there then, that is not my, my, main, my question, I mean, what is there a way uh, to, to make a kind of final model where we have uh, for, for all these stars like you know, how much, well, what the balance is the, 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 of the global mass? Transfer budget and yeah. what comes in, what goes out, uh, and is it is it uh, okay? And do we see this difference from start to start? Are the stars which are created most often the ones with the most mass as well? Yeah. Okay, that's one question. So I don't know where to begin. Um, so first of all, I think that okay, these objects are they're already quite diverse within their, within just a small sample that we have. We look at um, differences, for example, at the inner rib disk and everything. Um, so you have all these objects that have a much wider uh, gap, it seems, in the middle. And still there we see some accretion, or at least we see the jets still launched. Maybe there is a mass transfer there as well. So first of all, I think that something I don't expect there to be is the mass transfer because of rush slope overflow from the post HGB star. because post HGP star is now contracting quite rapidly. And so if it were transferring mass to the companion, it would be, well, it, it would shrink very, very rapidly because of the extra muscles. And so this wouldn't be a stable way of, uh, um, of sending matter to the companion either. Either. But what can happen, of course, is still a stellar wind or something that's launched by the, by the post HGP star that then is accreted by the companion as well. But I think that given um, the stability, or so given the fact that we see in all hydrodynamical models, but in all, basically all of them, that there is just always inflow of matter from the circumminer disk, that's we, I mean, that this is the main way in which you can feed the accretion onto the binding. Um, in any case, when we then look at the red rectangle, for example, I think that most of the material that we see there is already expelled previously by the giant star, although I'm not very, uh, well, I haven't looked into exactly what is going on with the red rectangle. There's a lot of observational information. There are a lot of things in literature on the red, red rectangle as well. But I, I thought that maybe uh, given the, I mean, this is somewhat of a protoplanetary nebula as well, I think, because you see a lot of mass outside the orbital plane as well. And I think that was just during the previous interaction phase when the progenitor of the post HGB star was still just the, the giant star, the HGB star itself. Um, and that's currently, we're just looking at the red rectangle as a system that is quickly becoming, quickly evolving towards the white war stage. And while that is happening, it's also creating a lot of material. And the idea that, um, and so one of the objections I think you had also was that you don't have enough, uh, that you kind of have a problem with the fact that there is, that the idea is that there is not a lot of mass in the envelope of the post HGB star and that you therefore dilute it very quickly. But that seems to but work quite well. The nebula around the red rectangle is very rich in the distance. Oh yeah, that's another uh, interesting yeah, phenomenon. Yeah, I'm... For that, I have really no clue about what's going on with this dual chemistry. Um, but I think the is the envelope of the red rectangle carbon rich itself. So the star itself in the center is that carbon rich? It, 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 and so the C over O is about one. Yeah, yeah because the dust is oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. So the disk is all, no. All our object seems to be oxygen rich always. 
And sometimes you have the nebula that is carbon rich, and I don't know how that can happen. So maybe you get a lot of um, ionizing radiation from some accretion, maybe that can um, split the CO molecule. I don't know, <laughs> actually, it's maybe. Yeah, thanks. Interesting. Then the next colleagues are uh, the promoters of our uh, PhD students. So I would like to hand over the floor to Dr. Omapons if he still has questions for Phila. <laughs> Uh, hello, Ben. <clears throat> uh, I've, I've asked so many questions to you over the last few years that uh, I think at this stage uh, I will not ask a question, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll, I will say something after the defense. So I'll hand it over to the next. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot. And I hand over to uh, Professor Kersenelemans. Hi again. Um, so I've also asked many questions uh, during uh, the four years. Uh, after today's defense, I actually had, still had one question, sort of the maybe the million dollar question that you have already tried to answer a few times uh, today. Um, we're missing something. And so what do you think we're missing? And I'll make life a little bit more difficult because I think you went that way with the discussion earlier in sort of common envelope like thing that could maybe boost the eccentricity and then you can take it from there. But one piece of information that really puzzles me, I think, is that in some cases it seems that the current orbital energy and angular momentum is even larger than it was at the time of the first interaction. Anyway, I won't ask you to re answer all the questions, so you can just be brief and tell me what's your intuition that you think uh, we're missing. Okay, yes, thanks. Um, so your comment is that uh, in some cases we see that the angular momentum right now of the binary is larger than that of the, uh, at the start of the interaction. But uh, yeah, so I'm not sure how we, uh, how we uh, maybe there's in that case a problem in, um, us predicting what the initial orbit must have been, although, uh, or are you referring to, the, for example, the case of RUSEN where we have a very eccentric orbit? But in that case, so okay, RUSEN was a very was a very difficult object to model <laughs> because it was it's in a very wide orbit and it's a post red giant branch star, which means that it must have interacted quite early already, and it looks like as if you cannot. Um, have that star fill its Roche slope at all in the past. So then what makes it uh, the binary so wide? And in that case, I think that it's only the orbital energy that is very large. But the angular momentum, because of the high eccentricity, is actually a lot lower if you, if you take that into account. And so, so if you would, for example, trace back the evolution onto uh, the, well, if you would, look at what the orbit would be in a circular orbit with the same angular momentum, then you can still have the mass transfer there. Uh, then you still have for slope overflow there. But So I think for RSN, the, the idea is that some interaction um, stripped away, or you know, yeah, so that some interaction, and then the question is, why is, the, why, the, why is there so much orbital energy in that, <laughs> in that system? That's another one, I don't know. But yeah, I think the idea is that it actually didn't uh, lose that much orbital energy and mainly lost some um, angular momentum. And that makes the orbit very eccentric and wide, but yeah, I'm not sure what, what goes there. And I'm also not sure what's missing here. And it must be either it started some, something already eccentric to begin with and never uh, circularized at any point, which is also in... Uh, an interesting way, um, but then maybe our tidal model is not up to date in that case. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Other than that, thanks. To be continued. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry. I said that's all. <laughs> 
Thanks for asking, Hermans. <laughs> then the last promoter is Professor Hans van Winkel. Yeah, with three promoters, I think you have had very many questions over the last four years, so I will, I will say something later. But not okay. Okay, so I'm the last one. As you know, I still don't understand Lindblad resonances, but you can explain me after. <laughs> I want to ask a question now. So, as this is a public event, I also have to give you opportunity to all the public to ask questions, and the public that is following online, they can put their questions in the chat, and they will be uh, looked at by Anna. So, if you have a question, it's right now for time to ask them either live or there is one. Okay, ah, please. <laughs> Should I? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the question is by Marta. <laughs> um, so what happens to the circumbinary disk after a post-HGB star becomes a white dwarf? And indeed, yeah, we already uh, had a similar question as that. So we expect that um, when the star becomes much hotter, it begins to send out a lot of ionizing radiation that then destroys the disk. Uh, and then you end up with the just uh, you know, no more, <laughs> I guess. Potentially a planetary nebula, although that's also maybe not uh, the case in if uh, the material that's, that most of the material is already um, dispersed too much and you don't see the planetary nebula anymore. But yeah, I think that's it. Okay, thanks. Oh, I'm not. I know. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's from my brother, so he asks. <laughs> He asks, your field uses a lot of concepts originating in thermodynamics. Is there enough cross-pollination between these fields? Um, good question, actually. So, um, well, I think that's the that's most... <laughs> I do you think that's a different scientific discipline? So many parts. Well, I think that most of the um, uh, people that do the... So, okay, for if you do, for example, the... So the modeling of uh, um, stars or of any kind of system, and of course the thermodynamic uh, concepts are always very present in everything you do. And I think that most of the uh, people that work here on uh, on modeling these systems are very well versed in uh, thermodynamics already. But I don't know that you can have, um, for example, problems. Well. Something that really requires still a lot of uh, work is, for example, the equation of states in stars and other kinds of objects. And I think that there's some cross-pollination uh, going on already between the people that do um, uh, try to solve the structure of uh, or the equation of states and then the people that actually implement it in the, in the computer codes we use. I think that's, uh, thanks. <laughs> okay. So another one from uh, Thomas Wevers. Uh, can you get better constraints on the core mass of post hp stars from astroseismic modeling of the pulsations than you get from binary evolution? That's quite difficult because we don't see um, any gravity waves, for example, in our uh, post hp stars. What we see is very strong radial pulsations, but those are quite independent of the core mass, except for the fact that um, yeah, we use a core mass luminosity relation, and that is already quite uh, quite good for determining the luminosity because of tight relation that we have at that point. But so astroseismic modeling is then useful in the sense that we can determine the luminosity because these are kind of like Cepheid objects the type 2 class, so we can relate the uh, pulsation period to the luminosity of the star. Um, but then that's indirectly that we then still get the luminosity, well, core mass from the luminosity itself. So not directly is the, is the main uh, idea. 
Okay. One more. One more. Okay. Thank you, Emilio. Um, in the period eccentricity plots, there seems to be bimodality in eccentricity. Uh, so actually a good question. Uh, we also noticed that quite a number of orbits turned out to be around 0.2 and 0.3 eccentricity. It is difficult to, um, to say whether this is really because of, uh, whether this is real or whether this is just because of how the analysis goes, because there are also quite some systems that's okay, because we have a large uncertainty on, I should say this differently. So we have a large spread in our uh, radial velocities or large scattering in the radial velocities because of the strong pulsations of the star, which makes it more difficult to determine an eccentricity. And in order for us to say, okay, this orbit is eccentric, we go through a test that says where the null hypothesis is, okay, this is a circular orbit and then, uh, you need to check whether, okay, this is an eccentric orbit. And when you have a lot of scatter, then the orbit tends to go more to the circular case or the test goes to the circular case. So maybe we are losing out on some binaries that have an eccentricity of 0 0.1, 0 0.15. But uh, yeah, in, an, in any case, still quite interesting to see whether this would be a real if, or whether this is just something uh, that is just difficult to observe anyway. Thank you. Okay. Still going on? I have some questions from the live Yes. Uh, I'm glad. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice talk. Um, so I have a question. You had the period distribution very early on. You showed very nice in that observation to sit right in the middle where the models don't predict. Um, it should be. Um, I know it's really hard to find these long period systems. But has your work made us doubt in uh, these models, or have we just not found these stars? Yeah, so excellent question again. Um, so the long period orbits are indeed just difficult to find. So we expect those long period orbits to still be there. And those are then just uh, post HP binaries that might have not interacted as much. And then the question is um, will those long period orbits still also show a disk? That's maybe a, a different kind of question. So there is some cer certainly some observational bias towards not finding the long ones, because you also need to observe them for 30 years before you get the orbit. Um, and then on the short period or short period systems, we also don't expect to find many in the post HP phase, because otherwise you would still have fresh local overflow. But there is still, of course, a problem of why there is why we find so many orbits in a place where we don't expect any as a main problem that we have there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Last chance. Six months. And I think we we go to deliberation. We come back soon. I just I invite the online colleagues uh, to the virtual deliberation.
Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I will now proclaim the result of the deliberation by the exam committee appointed for the doctoral degree in science, astronomy, and astrophysics. Mr. Glenn Michael Owen has presented to the faculty his PhD thesis on the topic Evolutionary Properties of Post AGD Binaries. The partial fulfillment of the requirements for the PhD in science, astronomy, and astrophysics. And he has defended his thesis in a public session before the examination committee. The examination committee has determined that all requirements concerning the granting of the doctoral degree that are prescribed by the law, by the university regulations, have been met. Therefore, on behalf of the Rector of Kai Leuven, I confer upon Mr. Glenn Michael Omen the degree of Doctor in Science, Astronomy, and astrophysics. Congratulations, Glenn. Thank you. So I hereby officially close the session, but if I'm well informed, there are some few providers that will take the last word. Als een van de promoters is het altijd een eer om uh, de eerste te zijn, te zijn die de nieuwe dokter kan aanspreken met zijn nieuwe titel. Dus dokter Klein. Beste dokter Klein. Or, like they say, spen znat snel, zvratsam, se aan to tsebje, zvloeim, te teun, dokter Klein. Not too sure that, that, that was understandable, but anyway. <laughs> so, congratulations. These are likely not the circumstances of a PhD defense you had imagined one year ago. And even we cannot toast on the new doctor. I've seen in the jury, some of the jury members were already preparing for a toast. I saw in the background, but that's uh, can only be, and it was even Belgian beer, so it is only, it's, it's a pity, but on the other hand, it's still time to celebrate. We started uh, four years ago, Dr. Jan. Uh, and your, the project was entitled, Why are they white? The surprises of evolved binaries. We started, and Gijs and I had a few ideas how to develop it. And the first, let's say, more observational study was based on many years of Hermes radial velocity data, which is, of course, uh, near to my heart. And I think you were the perfect timing with your first year and the perfect match as you as a student to uh, tackle all those orbits. In fact, you also developed a certain, let's say, personal relation with some of the objects. And so I can, I can challenge you, I think, by saying a day, uh, an HD number, and I guess you know the orbit by heart. And even the eccentricity. Whether the error, I don't know whether you know the error, but, uh, So that was quite uh, nice to see. Then you quickly moved, uh, well, you moved to uh, Nijmegen, and Ono uh, joined as, the promo as one of the promoters. And you developed many ideas, and it was really nice to see how, in that whole process, you grew as a critical and even very self-critical researcher. You developed your research, and I think the last chapters of your thesis were really uh, impressive by how you developed the ideas into numerical uh, simulations and tested your uh, the original ideas. So uh, I think it was very impressive how you deal, you dealt with all the difficult. Uh, aspects and all the difficult parts there. So really, congratulations. And in the whole process, Dr. Glenn, there is something that you never lost your good mood. Somehow, you start with Glenn a discussion and you start with a smile and it ends with a smile. Examples are many, even when at difficult times, he just keeps on having a good mood. For instance, when you left to Nijmegen, it was unclear at the moment whether it was two years, one year, whether it was allowed for two years, whether one way, it was not very pleasant, and I can imagine certainly not for you, but you kept on having a nice balance and you kept on having a nice uh, uh, mood. 
Also as a TA trainer, so as a TA this year, uh, you did a very nice job. And I think that's one of an example there where the TA training is really a good uh, learning curve for our students as well. Also there, you kept on having your good mood, even when I give you 380 copies of the same question, you had to, you had to correct during, in the final phase of your PhD, that was not really a nice present, but nonetheless, you kept on having your smile on your face, and it was very appreciated. It was very nice, it was very pleasure to work with you. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Chase and Omo for the nice collaboration, and I think the good news is that despite the hard work of Glenn, there remains a few surprises to be solved. So as you've heard later in the, in the discussion as well, there is still a few puzzles to pack. So that's good. So we can continue with our work. Well, at least our work is not yet finished. Lovely. So Glenn, Dr. Glenn, sorry. What comes next on your professional way and path is yet unclear. Of course, I wish you all the best and whatever it will be and wherever it will lead you, I'm sure also your surroundings will be happy with you in a good mood that spreads around everywhere where you go. So now I'm happy to, off, to, to uh, give the floor to Ono, who also has the Laudatio for you. Thank you. <laughs> and that we give the present. Well, uh, <clears throat> dear Glenn, uh, dear Dr. Omen, I'm uh, very glad to uh, be able to congratulate you here. Uh, really well done. Uh, I'm only very sorry that uh, I have to do it in this way and that I cannot be there with you in the in the room to congratulate you in person. Uh, we will have to do that uh, in another way and in another occasion, I think. Um, <clears throat> so I well, I can mostly echo a lot of uh, what Hans has already uh, told you. Um, I got involved in, in your project uh, a bit later than, than Hans and Gijs. Uh, I joined and I started working with you when you uh, first came to Nijmegen uh, three, almost three years ago. Uh, and I must say I found this a very, very good and pleasant uh, experience. <clears throat> I really enjoyed working with you. Um, <clears throat> you did a great job, uh, that's obvious, and uh, I also must say I, I learned a lot from uh, working with you. I learned a lot about uh, the, the objects we were working on and that you were working on about post HB stars. Mm -hmm. I really uh, okay. gained a lot of knowledge about this. Um, <clears throat> but what I also learned is that, uh, <clears throat> yeah, modeling them is, is extremely difficult. Uh, a lot of ideas that we had, uh, when you tried to put them into practice, it seemed they didn't work or there were a lot of complications. And uh, it's really a tribute to you, I think, that you uh, managed to uh, yeah, to get these, these beautiful results that are now in your thesis. So I think you can be uh, very proud of that. And also uh, your friends and family can be, can be very proud of you. <clears throat> it's really uh, a beautiful piece of work. Um, so, yeah, what I could also uh, maybe add is that so you spent uh, a year in, uh, in Leuven and then two years in Nijmegen and the last year in Leuven again. And uh, we thought we had a, quite a good plan for that. But in the end, maybe the timing was not uh, perfect because during the years you were in Nijmegen, you ended up working mostly, uh, or at least the initial year, you worked a lot on the observational aspects. And by the time it, uh, you got to work on the final chapter, which uh, involved the binary evolution and interactions, uh, it was almost time for you to go back to Leuven again. So I think that could have worked out uh, better, but in the end, um, yeah, we had very good communication and it, it worked out uh, really well. And uh, the result is there, that's, that's, uh, that's very clear. <clears throat> Uh, what also in the end worked out well, I think, is, is having these three supervisors. <clears throat> so initially two, and then you got the third one. Uh, and that sounds like a luxury, maybe, but uh, it's not necessarily a luxury. Um, yeah, it can also uh, be the case that uh, you're kind of caught between all these supervisors, and it's not really clear who is uh, responsible at any particular time. So I was a bit uh, afraid that uh, you might feel that way uh, at some point uh, during the course of the three years. But I, I was happy to read in your in your thesis in the end that you actually found that this uh, 
this worked well and that you're very happy with uh, with the, the arrangement we had between the three supervisors. So that's uh, that's all. Uh, that's all. Yeah, I think both these things in the end, although maybe less than perfect, they really worked out uh, really well. Um, yeah. So then, uh, <clears throat> during the years you were in Nijmegen, I, I uh, yeah, I got to know you. I already said it. I think as a very pleasant person uh, to work with, uh, very knowledgeable about uh, the topic you're working on, but also in a in a broader sense, you uh, you really had a broader interest in in uh, related topics uh, to your thesis. Um, and uh, yeah, you also uh, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, Hans also alluded to it that you. Uh, were very sort of you stayed calm during your uh, your research. You were going, and you couldn't be, uh, uh, yeah, you wouldn't be left off uh, track, uh, even when uh, things that we tried didn't work out, and you had to uh, redo the models or try out different things. You always stayed very calm, and you just, uh, yeah, were very persistent and, and 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 just going on. And I think that's a very good uh, quality. Uh, in you as, as a researcher that you uh, have this, this persistence and, and uh, will to just uh, go on and, and staying calm in the process, not not panicking. Uh, well, I don't think there's ever a reason to panic, but anyway, it's, it's, things were difficult at some point, and, uh, but you stayed very calm in this process. Um, <clears throat> So I would also like to comment briefly on uh, on your role in in Nijmegen. Uh, as when you were there, you uh, I think you played. Uh, I think you enjoyed it very much, and I also think that everybody at the department uh, enjoyed your presence and your and your participation in the in all the activities at the institute very much. I think you uh, you were you played a big part in the also in the social life at the institute, uh, and I th you were just a great colleague to to everybody at. Uh, at the department in Nijmegen. So uh, I'd like to thank you also for that. Also for your role in, in the teaching uh, that you uh, also did partly in Leuven and partly in Nijmegen. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, yeah conclude now. Again, many congratulations. Um, I understand your future is still quite open. Uh, so it could go many ways. You, uh, of course, have to constrain that you uh, want to stay together together with your loved one, and it's uh, very important. Uh, I can only say that if you do choose a career in science, then I think you can be uh, very successful in that because you've got the, the right uh, qualities uh, to, to continue. But uh, that's, of course, uh, to be seen what, what you're going to do. So again, let me congratulate you, and uh, I hope I've been audible all the time because my internet connection has uh, been uh, <coughs> a bit bad occasionally. Um, and uh, again, I hope to uh, congratulate and drink a beer with you at some point uh, in the future when uh, we can meet again. So thank you very much, Glenn. And Thanks. Congratulations. Thanks. You have three promoters also bought you a gift, which is related to your um, thesis. Okay. And it's a desktop model of a binary star. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll turn off here. Or maybe actually I can do it here. Maybe. <laughs> right. So We need sticks. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pretty cool. Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you like a kid right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. All right. <laughs> so it has the moment of inertia, it has two, there are two, and it has a transfer of angular momentum. Awesome, you, thank you. <laughs> so yeah. after a while it starts to Yeah. Wow, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Super nice. Also show it to this side of the audience. And further than that, that was the closest we could get <laughs> as a binary star. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so.
right. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, <that> is... <laughs> I guess I should also say a couple of words. Stand over here. Um, well, first of all, I think the main thing that I should say is that I, I really enjoyed my time during my PhD. The past four years have been absolutely amazing. Uh, that's mainly due to uh, actually several factors. So first of all, the two departments are absolutely great. And I really enjoyed my time in NAMI and Leuven as well. And uh, I made a lot of new friends, so I'm very happy for that as well. Um, but of course, the topic I also loved as well, our research and our uh, and our science that we've been doing together. It was really, really nice. And I think also that supervisors are in part responsible for the great, uh, for great supervision that I've been uh, receiving. So I said this many times already that I think the combination of three of you is absolutely great um, to have during, uh, during my PhD. I think the combination of you three is perfect match <laughs> scientifically. I don't know, maybe our personalities also matched a bit. I don't know why, but it was absolutely great. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say been a very interesting defense right now. We have a filled auditorium that is actually 20% capacity, maybe. Um, there is this camera pointing at me the whole time. It's very strange <laughs> to have that. But I think that everything went quite smoothly. So also thank you to Anna for uh, being there to do, to do the, some of the moderating that was involved. And I should also, of course, uh, thank my uh, my closest one, so my family, my parents that are present here. So thank you for supporting me during my studies, physics, astronomy, supporting me all, all the way. And uh, yeah, thanks for that. And also Andrea, of course, thank you for supporting me as well, for being there the whole time in uh, Nijmegen and Leuven as well. And especially, I think it must have been difficult to have a person finishing his PhD thesis uh during the lockdown <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for sharing all the stress with me it's absolutely great uh, yeah i think that's that's all i wanted to say so many thanks to everyone also the ones that are uh, online so i guess i should uh, conclude here so um, bye everyone that is online i hope you